Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for this uh, final issue briefing, day one of the annual meeting 2019 here in the Media Centre. A, a cold walk away from the warmth of the, uh, of the, of the very snug Congress Centre. So very great, grateful for you for joining us. Also, thanks for watching us live online at weforum.org and over our social media channels. We've been doing a bit of a tour of a global commons on day one of this meeting. We started off looking at the civil society space and, and, the, and, and, and the way that technology is affecting the, you know, the, the global commons there. We've uh, moved into technology and the digital world an hour ago, le you know, learning about the prospects of creating a digital commons, a, a utopian, a return to a utopia um, on the online world. And now we're talking about possibly one of our most fragile global commons, it's, it's the ocean. And we're zoning in on a, one particular issue affecting the health of our oceans. It is underwater mining. Um, uh, from our perspective, it's an institutional area of priority for our Centre for Public Goods and, uh, and uh, Environment. Seabed and river mining is touted as a new source for precious metals such as manganese, nickel, copper and cobalt. But there are also geopolitical and ecological implications of this new technology. So we're going to try to find out as much about it as possible in this short period of time that we have. Very glad to be joined by, by three very esteemed colleagues. Doug McCauley, you're a professor at University of California, Santa Barbara, USA, also a former fisherman, so you've uh, got experience from, from two different livelihoods linked to the ocean. David Garofolo, you're a president and chief executive officer of Gold Corp, uh, a, a mining company not exclusively mining gold, but um, an extractive industry um, which arguably could be at the forefront of this new technology. Sinjin, you're the chief executive officer of Conservation International, based in the USA. Doug, I'm going to start with you. Underwater mining, it's a panacea. We're expanding our planetary boundaries at a time where we need these important minerals for renewable energy such as cars and, and, and batteries. We're providing new routes for economic growth and we're avoiding some of the, um, some of the, some of the nasty elements of the supply uh, chains of, of the existing extractive industries such as child labour, other humanitarian challenges. It's got to be a good thing, correct? <laughs> Well, I think you're, you're hitting right to the heart of this issue. Um, so we, probably the biggest f uh, problem that's facing uh, the oceans right now is not deep sea mining. The biggest problem that's facing our oceans is climate change. So as you mentioned, what we really need to do is accelerate towards building out a, an infrastructure of renewable energy to be able to get something that uh, uh, has much lower carbon footprint so that we don't over acidify, overheat our ocean. Now, um, Many people argue that uh, in order to build that hardware for this renewable revolution, and of course the energy is totally infinite, you can make as much uh, energy as you want from the sun, but you need to build stuff to capture that energy. That, as you mentioned, has real raw material requirements, and people are saying that now, just as you mentioned, instead of going into some of these um, challenged supply chains on land, everyone knows some of the challenges with cobalt, we should be looking into the oceans, because there are indeed some of these minerals located in the oceans, just the, the very minerals that you mentioned. So cobalt, manganese, rare earth elements, the raw ingredients for the sustainable revolution. But there are many, many complexities associated with doing this industry underwater, doing it in the oceans. And then we're just in the science community beginning to get our head around what kinds of problems we might create if we try to build a solution by moving renewables and moving mineral sourcing into the oceans. And unfortunately, it seems the problems could be quite large. Tell us more about these problems. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the challenges of mining in the oceans is that unlike on land, when you go into the oceans and you try to excavate a bunch of sediment, um, when you're mining on land, you put it somewhere, it stays put. When you're doing that in the ocean, you get a large plume of sediment that travels. The ocean moves like a river. And so this plume of sediment could cause lots of harm. Um, still, a lot of uncertainty, I think, in the science community about exactly what the magnitude and the dynamics of that challenge could be. But for example, it could uh, suffocate some of the food webs or compromise some of the food webs that fuel fisheries in the space. And remember, um, you know, uh, some of the spaces we're proposing to mine, the one million square kilometers of the oceans that we're proposing to mine, uh, overlaps with fisheries like tuna fishing, which is a $40 billion enterprise and is, um, as Sanjay knows well, a very important source of food for local and global economies. So you could, these plumes could suffocate some of these um, food webs which tie to tuna. There are a lot of uncertain impacts about what those plumes could do for the ocean's potential to sequester carbon or what its role in climate change might be. And lastly, there's some 
impacts, real impacts on uh, biodiversity that lives down there. There's some amazing things. I, I brought a specimen here from the deep ocean to share with you, hmm. but there are some amazing species that live down there that are truly unique, old, uh, uh, ecologically important, that would obviously be directly impacted by the industry. Let's, let's show our viewers online what, what, what you've got here, what yeah. you've brought from all the way from Santa Barbara. It took a little of explaining to move this through security at Davos, but uh, this is a, a Hawaiian gold coral, um, and it's truly beautiful. It has uh, sort of gem-like qualities to it. You actually can make jewelry out of it. Um, no offense, but I, I'm, I'm more fond of gold coral for its beauty than even gold itself. Um, <laughs> But um, what really impresses me about this coral is not its, its sort of luster, but its age. So it's older than all of us. This coral's older than Switzerland. It's in fact older than the Holy Roman Empire. This was collected after it died in the oceans by a set of researchers at Stanford. And uh, um, these kinds of species, very old, truly globally unique, are found in some of the spaces that we're proposing to mine. And, and just to go on that, on the, this beautiful piece of coral for dwell on that for a few seconds longer. The risk to coral is from ocean acidification and, and heating up as well. Put, put mining into perspective as in terms of how grave a threat is it compared to the other portfolio of issues that, that are threatening our biodiversity under the sea. Right, well, I'm gonna go back to my first message, which is you're absolutely right, that when we're thinking about corals and coral futures, and we all need to because there are rainforests of the sea, there are refrigerators of the sea, they're a huge source of tourist income. We need to protect them. The threat there is not yet mining, it's climate change. We need to come up with an adaptation strategy to get over climate change. Um, now, um, uh, the real challenge here is that, uh, and the real opportunity with mining is that right now we're at the prospecting phase. As I said, we've put on the map all of these claim areas where we're beginning to explore the ocean for minerals. The next stage in, in uh, seabed mining will be going full-scale commercial extraction. But the really neat thing, as I mentioned, the opportunity, is that we're writing the rules now for this industry ahead of actually going fully commercial. So there's a really special chance for us to try to get these rules right if we elect to do that. And of course, you know, as somebody who's very connected to beautiful corals and to deep sea ecosystems and to fisheries and to climate change, I actually think there's some clever things we do to not even pull the trigger on it. But alongside working on some of those angles, I think there's a really exciting opportunity to work on this policy, make it more responsible for the oceans, make it more responsible for industry ahead of the beginning of this industry. Again, truly unique, uh, arguably the first global extractive industry in which we get to write the rules before it started. So a perfect time to bring in industry. David, you're a business leader. Uh, your company, I, don't, and I believe, does not um, engage in underwater mining at the moment, um, but is this because of a, 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 a desire for conservation, or is this a rational business decision? Presumably, you have an obligation to your shareholders to look at the, the most cost-effective way of gaining the minerals and the extractives that, that your customers need. Well, I think it's both, but I should add, I don't know that anybody's actually commercially mining underground currently anywhere in the world. Uh, but what would make us cautious is uh, the undefinable ecological implications. Uh, when we're mining on Earth, uh, we have to, or dry land, we actually have to file a closure plan before we actually move a ton of ore. Uh, we have to know exactly how we're going to close a mine, how we're going to re recuperate or recover the land around which we're uh, disturbing or operating. Um, and so the, the inability to do that in an underseas environment would, would make it very difficult for us to get a social license in our view. And so I think that's the initial challenge. The more practical commercial uh, challenge is the fact that you really can't define a reserve or a mineral inventory under sea. Um, you might be able to uh, discern a, uh, an ecological, or a, I should say a geological complex, uh, but it's hot, tough to find enough mineral inventory to actually tap into traditional sources of capital, because if a bank is going to lend you money, they want to understand the size of your reserves. Uh, even uh, an equity investor on the stock exchange, again, wants to understand how long the mine life is, what kind of return they're going to get on their invested capital, and the inability to define um, a geological base really makes tapping into traditional sources of capital very, very challenging. I think that's the biggest commercial impediment, but the environmental one is a significant one as well. 
Is that because the industry is, or this branch of the, the, the mining industry, is in its infancy? Are we going to have much more sophisticated ways of, of gauging the, uh, the infantry <coughs> under the sea, or, or, or much more cost-effective ways of, of extracting it as soon as people start figuring out how to optimize these systems? Well, I, I think there's actually more we can do uh, on dry land. Um, I think we can drive down our water intensity. Uh, we can automate a lot of what we do and drive down our labor intensity. Um, you talk about child labor. I don't know of any child labor among any of our mines, among the large scale mining companies. Um, you know, these are high paying union jobs with, you know, uh, traditional sources of labor. Uh, but we're actually driving down our labor intensity and there's still a lot of work to do in that regard uh, to reduce uh, not only our, our carbon footprint, our water footprint, but also uh, make our operations considerably safer. Okay, uh, Sanjay, you're yes. um, you're head of Conservation International, right? Uh, based in the USA, so you're not you're not you're not married to the land or the ocean, but you have a kind of more holistic picture. Yeah. Put into perspective for us um, your your vision for what you know, the, how to conserve the oceans and sure. and you know the the degree to which we should be prioritizing this breaking issue. So make no mistake, this is coming, right? And make no mistake, undersea mining will be. Uh, scaled and commercially available on the planet much faster than most of us think. Uh, the one company that really got into it, Nautilus Mining, I think, you know, they kind of lost their shirts in the process. Uh, you know, their stock price just like went way up and then they made some fairly tricky deals in Papua uh, that uh, ultimately the government, you know, created some trouble in and it now has nosedived back again, which has put a little bit of a hold on investors want to get into space, but our thirst for uh, these minerals is going to continue. Now, um, uh, partly because of the clean energy revolution, partly because of all the mobile technologies that we use. I'm, I'm, I've got an iPad right here in front of me, right? That's made from minerals that's coming somewhere. What I'd like to see us do is, uh, I'd say two things, or maybe three things. First is, I'd like to see us mine trash, right? So, um, you know, we did a big deal with Apple uh, last Earth Day to really encourage people to go out and recycle um, their mobile devices. Uh, and we did that with Apple because uh, Apple was keen to be able to extract all the good stuff in here that they can put into another uh, machine. So that's kind of has to be really maximized first and foremost. The second is to your point. So this is where it really is scary. We all kind of know it's coming. That's why we're having this forum here. Mm -hmm. But the, the challenge is we don't really know what to do about it because look, Conservation as a movement is always behind the eight ball. I mean, we don't really start talking about something until it literally becomes a crisis. Think about plastics. Think about plastics in the ocean. When I was a kid, I knew about plastics in the ocean. I mean, when I was a child in Sri Lanka, I knew about plastics in the ocean. It's only been the last two years, maybe, that it's really burst into the consciousness of the public. That's, you know, a 40-year run. Um, we cannot afford to do that with, with the planet anymore. So your, your notion of writing the rules, it's kind of like you know, tinkering with the human genome where we're sort of, you know, it's that kind of thing where we're really writing the rules into a new field that we know very, very little about. So it's a place where truly science needs to lean in very heavily to give us in conservation the confidence that we can devote our resources to taking um, action on this. And then finally, when it comes to mining, so. Uh, Newmont Mining now, your, your new friends and partners, I guess, or owners, I should say. You know, we've, uh, Conservation International worked with them for many, many years. So we do see responsible mining as a really important thing. It, it is likely that you can do it uh, even in the oceans. Um, the question is under what targets and the one, under what guidelines, and that's where it's wide open. Um, which, which does bring us back to that, you know, that you know, the remarkable um, point you made, David, there's a commercial imperative for you not to go into this, this state of the matter. There's also an environmental one. But do you think that could be reconciled? It seems like Doug and, and, and the academic community are quite keen to work with business to figure out a way of, 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 of pioneering this, this, this new technology, this new source of planetary reserves in a way that could be responsible, possibly even sustainable. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, active engagement with stakeholders early on in the process, regardless of whether we're mining on dry land or whether we're mining under the ocean, extremely important to make sure that we have an, a firm understanding or a cohesive understanding of, of the impact of what we're doing, the disturbance we're going to uh, cause on the host communities or the host areas that we're mining. Uh, but the R&D has to catch up as well. And I think we're a long way from there, to be honest with you. I, I think 
Uh, we're not at a point where it's commercially viable. I don't think the technology is at a sufficient scale mm -hmm. to justify uh, or make a, a commercially viable um, option for, for bringing uh, undersea mining into, um, into viability in the short term. If I may I just add some, you know, it'd be interesting to hear what you have to say on this, but my understanding is a lot of the mining that has been proposed right now really targets these seamounts, yeah. uh, which is where these mineral deposits are. And seamounts, it turns out, are real factories for fisheries. Mm -hmm. And so you have this unfortunate uh, coincidence of um, places which are really important fisheries, which are re relatively poorly known, uh, which is also now in the crosshairs of uh, you know, undersea mining. And by virtue of being undersea, they're out of, you know, out of sight of 99.999% of, of the population. So there's a real, real challenge there. Yeah, no, you're, I think you're absolutely right. So there are a handful of key resource areas that people are looking and considering mining. Seamounts are one of those. Um, you mentioned also uh, C4 massive sulfides as, as mm -hmm. being one of these uh, vent-associated mm. um, geological features that may be rich in precious minerals, including gold. Another of the key areas, which may actually be the first um, that people are putting more investment in and more momentum behind, is mining what's called uh, polymetallic nodules. So they're these potato-like deposits on the abyssal plain, and many of them in the Pacific. There's an area in the Pacific that is as wide as the continental United States that's currently been demarcated in different claim areas for exploring these uh, polymetallic nodules. Um, so there's a, there's a host of different minerals people are looking at. Um, you know, I appreciate all the comments about, uh, uh, about uh, innovation and, uh, um, and about uh, you know, sort of getting ahead of this with policy. I do think, um, in, in many ways, I appreciate the message that you've delivered, David, which is that you, know, you colleagues in other mining sectors, have um, centuries, truly, of experience trying to get this right on land, dealing, as you say, with uh, environmental challenges, dealing with innovation to make things more efficient on all axes, from carbon to mm -hmm. water to human health. Um, you know, I, I, I almost feel that uh, the sort of, you know, the devil, if you will, that we know on land is better than the devil we don't in the ocean. <laughs> Now, I just mean the challenges that we face and yeah. the solutions that we've created for those challenges on land give us an entire textbook. Mm -hmm. And you've written a good portion of that textbook about how to do this right on land. I'm really concerned that uh, you know, there's not an opportunity for a community of things that are thousands of years old for us to make mistakes in the ocean. There's not opportunity with us living on the edge with climate change to make a mistake accelerating climate change if, in fact, there's some role that plumes play in carbon sequestration in the oceans. There's not any, um, there's not any margin of error for us messing up fisheries, as, yeah. as you mentioned. So I'm a little bit concerned about the experimental elements. of. I love what you said about mining trash. Maybe there's an opportunity to clean up some of these humanitarian issues, not in gold, but to, in cobalt, for example. There's some element of that, and that's one of the minerals we're looking at in oceans. I think there's a great opportunity for innovation. Can we invent our way around some of these dependencies? Can we create new batteries that don't require cobalt? So I really hope that there's actually an opportunity to use creativity, ingenuity, to not actually start this new mining industry in the oceans. Um, I'd love to double down on reinforcing the sustainability of mining um, that we have so much wonderful experience doing well on land. And I, and I do agree, we need to do more on the recycling side uh, to bring more metal back into the market. But make no mistake, that's still a drop in the ocean in terms of what <laughs> our demands are going to be as we start to industrialize more of uh, the developing world. Um, we've only just started in China. 60% of that population is still not urbanized. We haven't even really started in wide swaths of Africa in terms of industrializing those countries and getting more uh, rural popular, urban populations built up, and, and that's much more metal intensive. So make no mistake, we do need more primary sources of metal, but I do think we have a lot of scope on land to, to, to get that metal. Uh, and we'd have to mine lower grade deposits, but if we drive down our water intensity, water consumption, drive down our energy intensity, labor intensity, we can make a lot of those lower grade deposits much more economic than underseas deposits could potentially be. Mm -hmm. And you know, we spend so much time on studying the impact uh, of our mining activities on fish and fauna on, on, on land. And we've really gotten our hands, to Doug's point, we've really gotten our hands around that um, over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, we're still very much in the infancy in terms of underseas mine development, uh, and really understanding the ecological impact of disturbing Underseas, uh, underseas territory. But don't you think it's coming? I mean, I, you seem yeah. to be quite uh, uh, pessimistic about it, it actually being here, whereas I think it's going to be around the corner. 
I, I, I'm not as convinced. I'm not sure it's going to be in my lifetime. And, that's and amazing. I think I'm still pretty young. But, um, you know, I think we still have a bit You're of... Taking, I think friendly already, bet here. Yeah, you, I could be wrong, but I, I, am, I, I have a deep skepticism as the commercial viability. Again, the big issue is being trying to, trying to define geologically enough inventory to, to attract traditional sources of capital. That's the biggest impediment. R&D aside, let's just say the R&D can be resolved. It's, it's really drilling out your deposits. I have difficulty drilling deposits underneath lakes. I need, frozen, I need frozen territory. You can do it in northern Canada, for example, but you can't do it in, in more southern or warmer climes um, in the southern hemisphere. It's just very difficult to do. Um, so w we can't obviously freeze oceans, so getting drill setups on oceans is, is impossible. Uh, and the technology doesn't exist to drill the seabed uh, to sufficient depth to define those reserves, and that's the challenge. And that's what's really going to impede us from developing these, these under, undersea deposits. I'm sure they exist, but can we define them? That's the question. We have an industry skeptic from the industry side. That's right. fantastic. I know. I <laughs> violent, violently that. disagree this with is, you. This <laughs> is the beauty of issue briefings in Davos. Um, <laughs> we've only got a few minutes left. I don't want to deprive the audience of any questions. If you have any questions, raise your hands. Otherwise, I think let's just go back to the, 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 the future. We're looking at globalization 4.0. It's all about how we avoid the mistakes of previous rounds of global integration. How do we make sure that the future is sustainable, it's inclusive, it's fairer? We're going to need the minerals to in urbanize and to keep on industrializing. There are new ways of doing it. You're talking about e-waste. I know for a fact, and I can't break any of the numbers because there's an embargo, but we were going to be producing some research on Thursday um, outlining the economic potential of, of urban mining, um, which is more dense in terms of gold than you get in the ground. It could be a you know, really exciting new revenue stream. Um, and there are new technologies. So is there a way of, of making renewable energies that don't need the same resources? Where are we going to find the sustainability we so badly need? Is it about expanding our planetary boundaries? Is it about reducing the amount that we they actually consume? Yeah, you know, for me, I, I think it again is back to creativity and human ingenuity. Of course, that essential agreement agree, ingredient in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, in, in your industry, in conservation for that matter. And in some ways, it's the, it is the driver that created climate change, which is this thing that now has us all looking for more ingredients to build out renewables. It was genius and creative to figure out how to turn dead dinosaurs into kilowatts, right? I would double down on creativity to say, I'm here at the table with you, uh, Sanja, and everybody else, because I agree with you, Sanja, that we're looking at a future with high probability that we're gonna pull the trigger on deep sea mining. I wouldn't be here if we weren't. I don't think we'd be hosting this conversation if it wasn't right on the horizon. But I still think there's a time for us to consider those complexities they laid out, impacts on fisheries, impacts on biodiversity, impacts on climate change, and to apply this amazing human resource creativity to see if we can't invent our way out of it. Again, you know, mine those trash heaps. Um, do a better job of actually inventing new solutions that don't create dependencies that take us into the oceans. Um, and I think uh, there's a lot of potential there. And I think that's where I would be. If we're making bets, put a bet down that says we're going to leverage the power of creativity to actually not go forward with this. And what kind of creativity is the industry bringing to um, this need to establish a sustainable future? Well, what I would say is um, if we're really trying to deal with uh, climate change, uh, the, the heating of the planet, our metal intensity will only go up in, in terms of consumption. I think it could double or triple on a per capita basis just because renewable energy requires uh, significant amounts of copper, uh, for example, uh, more than any other metal. Um, and so I do think we have to source alternative sources of, of, of metal, you know, whether it's recycling or, again, looking at lower-grade deposits. So I, I, I don't think there's really a, a plausible scenario where we're going to drive down our, our consumption of metals. It'll only go up as we focus on um, solutions renewable energy solutions that, that drive down our carbon emissions. Sanjay, what's your, what's your prognosis for the yeah, creativity? Wow. Well, listen, I, I think there are people thinking right now about how to go find an asteroid and rope it and bring it down and <laughs> mine the minerals for it. And so if people are thinking about that, you know, just think about how quickly technology has outpaced humans' ability to really control it. Like, for, you know, it took us 10,000 years to get used to a wheel, and then it took us another 2,000 years to get used to a particular type of arrowhead. And then someone changed it a little bit and it became that arrowhead, right? Today, that, that technology, you know, like as Tom Friedman says, you know, we have the power of gods, but the mental capacity of Neanderthals. I have no doubt that what we can imagine in the future will happen. I guess my only 
and I, and I completely agree with you in saying that large amounts of the world are still don't have those basics. And the basic need of, of humanity has to be, must be met in terms of energy, in terms of access well, to clean water, et cetera, uh, education, health care, um, rights of everyone, uh, particularly women. Um, but I will say one thing. You know, it's amazing when you come to the World Economic Forum and you look at every index of human development and how it's generally gone up. Um, you know, except in terms of contentment and happiness. And so while I agree with you that we do have to think about the global south in a major way, I do think that at some point people are going to, what are we going to do with the billions and billions and billions of dollars that companies and individuals are sitting on? And these environmental solutions that we're proposing, whether it's climate change or biodiversity, it lacks a couple of zeros at the end of it. It really does. And when you realize that you've got 10 years to get this right, that that's what's different about the world today, right? It's not that we know the catastrophe. We've known that for a while. We know now that the window for meaningful action is pretty limited. Um, I think we ought to add some zeros to the end of, end of that. We can't add zeros to the, the date which we have no. to create action for. So one right. last question just to uh, give our audience something to think about and, and myself as well this evening, as if I haven't got nothing to keep me up at night. <laughs> can we win? Can we beat climate change? Uh, well, we have to. I mean, it's what it comes down to, is that, uh, I mean, we are truly heating the planet up faster than we ever have before. We're acidifying our oceans faster than we've ever acidified them before. We're pulling oxygen out of our oceans. The last time those things happened, we created the biggest mass extinction our planet has ever seen, where 90% of the species on the planet went extinct, called the Great Dying. We can't have that history recreate itself. That's a pretty dramatic part of climate biodiversity interactions. We don't want any part of that history. So I guess my message is we have to. We don't have a choice. Okay. That's uh, beautiful. Set. It's a very positive, <laughs> very positive opinion, which we like. We had this this morning as well. The, the, the forum bias for positivity. But you're right, we do have to. David, what's your view? Oh, no, I, I agree entirely. And, and, uh, I don't for a moment underestimate our ability as humans to actually find solutions uh, and to find additional sources of materials uh, and, uh, that we need in order to uh, drive down our carbon emissions and, and cool the planet. I, I'm very, very optimistic about that. Whether it's undersea mining or our ability to mine more effectively on Earth, yeah. or on dry land, we will find solutions. Who would have thought, and I know it's controversial, that oil fracking would have liberated uh, oil. You know, we had peak oil 10 years ago, not anymore. Suddenly, the U.S. has become self-sufficient in oil production. So I, I, I'm optimistic that technologies will be developed in order to meet our material requirements and drive down uh, the temperatures on our planet. Sanjay. Uh, hum you look, humans have never existed on a planet with more than 300 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's never happened. Humans have never existed on the planet with anything more than that. We're at I, probably 410 if you go look at it right now. So we're way past anything that we have experienced in the past. We're in completely uncharted territories. I totally agree with you. We have to. We will live with it. The difference is whether, and, and we won't just all die, and the planet won't just completely melt. Um, you know, there will be life on Earth, including human and non-human life. But what that future looks like will be dramatically different for billions of people. And that's where you don't want to be looking back in my lifetime, thinking we should have done a little bit more when we could have. So we're optimistic about the future, advisedly so, but, and, uh, but I'm unsure whether seabed mining is going to play a big part of this. I think the jury is relatively split on this one. <laughs> the, the conservationists and, and industry taking different lines. Thank you so much. Fascinating conversation. Um, whether it's something we will revisit, I guess, will depend on whether David uh, is right. right or, <laughs> or whether he is. I hope he is. I, I, so, I really am willing so, to do $100 uh, or a great this. margarita, whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> watch this You're space, on. but don't watch it too closely. But we'll be back if, uh, if, we, if we need to. Thank you very much for joining thank us you. here tonight, and thank you for watching live and thank you for joining us here in the audience. This session is now over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.